music and hopefully they'll come in soon and join us. But our next song, we'll stand and sing together. But this first song, you're more than welcome to sing if you want. If you want to just sit, just kind of prepare your hearts and minds for worship, that's fine too. Don't feel like you have to do anything, but just be here. Be here in the presence of one another. Lord of all creation. Of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. this next song together and it is such a beautiful day early in the morning it has been a beautiful day we've got an extra hour of sleep or an extra hour to do whatever you need to do, needed to do last night but it always always great when we fall behind until five o'clock when it's dark right and then we're like wait a minute it's dark really early but it's all wonderful and we give all the glory and honor and praise to our lord and savior so as we sing this next song let's just join our voices and lift him up to song this morning. Our God, He's greater. The water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the ashes you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. No one like you, none like you. 
awesome and power our God. Our God. We're going to go back and sing that whole song again. Here we go. What are you turning to wine? What are you turning to wine? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Welcome to Imagine Church. We are so happy to be get together in worship this morning. And if you are new to Imagine, we welcome you. And we hope that you will be filled with the presence of unconditional love in the midst of as we sing glory to the Lord and praise his holy name. Let us pray. Father, we gather together, the sheep of your pasture, to make a joyful noise, grateful for the sweet sounds of voices gathered together in praise and worship. We enter into your presence as a community of faith, a fellowship of believers to give thanks to you for your steadfast love and bring glory, honor, and praise to your name forever. Be with us this morning as we dedicate this time, this day, and our lives to you. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we bring it down a little bit to prepare our hearts and minds truly for worship, let's go to God in prayer. Whatever uh, this means to you, because it is different for everyone, and we're one body, but we're all going through different emotions and times in our lives. So as we sing this next song, really just be in prayer with God and let him into your lives and let him into your heart this morning. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been you will be you pledge yourself to me and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips Father 
This is the story of Henry Lovegood. That's not Henry. Ah, this is Henry. Henry lived a simple life. But simple as he was, so did he live in discipline, upright character, and profound cleanliness. But on this day, a Sunday like any other, Henry would make one fatal mistake. It wasn't in the way he meticulously prepared his breakfast. It wasn't in the way he meticulously ate his piggy toast. But rather it was in the way he prepared himself, his very soul, for that one fateful Sunday. Oblivious to what awaited him, Henry left his home, never to return the same. For you see, Henry had set his own trap. He'd rung his own bell. And now the bell tolled for him. Don't be like Henry. Don't get left behind. Set your clocks back for daylight savings. Robert Farley, you got left behind too? The motto of Imagine Church is no one left behind. And no one was here frightfully early this morning, so everyone must have remembered to turn their clocks back, I guess. We're glad you're here this morning. Welcome to Imagine Church, and grace to you in peace in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. 
We want you to know that whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith journey, there's a place for you here with us. And we're so grateful you took time out of a busy fall schedule to attend to the things of God and to be here for this time of worship this morning. We're honored to have you here. We have some first-time worshipers with us this morning, and that's always an honor for us. And we're glad to have you worshiping with us here today. Just a couple folks that we want to celebrate today, one of which is a, a couple that were united here in marriage last evening. How many people do you know get married on a Saturday night and are in church on Sunday morning? I'm so impressed. This is Scott and Deborah Tadlock. Let's congratulate them. But Scott and Deborah, our congratulations to you as you begin married life together. And thank you for being at worship today. But for a couple that got engaged here one Sunday before church, I guess we should not be surprised that they're here with us for worship. But we're honored to have you here today. And also, we have a new grandbaby in our midst. Phil Griffin and Cindy, our new grandparents. Cora uh, Keating Griffin was born on, um, what day was it? This past, the first, the first of November, uh, down in Charleston, South Carolina. Adam and Jessica Griffin are the parents. And Phil, we congratulate you and your family on this new edition. We're happy for you. If you're new to Imagine Church, one of the things that you need to know about us is that this is a very missions conscious congregation with a heart for serving people who are in need. And one of the great things that we do is something that takes place on the Wednesday, the day before every Thanksgiving, with Thanksgiving dinners that we provide to needy families throughout this entire area. And the coordinator of this effort is Carrie DiDonato. Carrie, come up and share just a word about where we stand with our Thanksgiving dinners and what we can do to help with that. And we thank you. I'm going to take a little different spin on it today. I don't have the inflatable turkey, which my girls have dubbed Fred. But Fred is out in the lobby. In the lobby there I saw. Um, I wanted to start today by saying um, that Tabby and Lexi and Shayla, they're all fifth graders um, at Oak Ridge Elementary School, but when they were in kindergarten, Stephanie and I, <laughs> um, we started a, uh, a Girl Scout troop, and I, apparently I miss it so much. <laughs> <laughs> This was not part of the plan. Um, but we started a Girl Scout troop, Troop 1022. And um, we did it for four wonderful years. And um, this has been on our counter for the last, well, since Tabby was in second grade. <laughs> At one of our Girl Scout meetings, and I think it was when they were in second grade, it was the first year of brownies. And I think we were earning, working toward earning the philanthropy badge. And our activity for that particular brownie session, uh, we had 12 wonderful girls in our troop and we gave each girl this tiny little mason jar and we removed the metal from the top and we cut a piece of paper with a slot in it and we gave them some decoupage, some Mod Podge and some uh, tissue paper and we asked them to decorate beautifully these mason jars and to keep them on their counters, um, have their moms and dads fill them with coins throughout the week. If they found any money, they could drop them in and uh, when they got filled, to donate them, not to use the money on themselves, but to give it to others, to um, either just donate the money or use the money to buy something and then give that to somebody in need. And I just touched base with Lexi before service today, and I asked her how she spent her money, and not surprisingly, she donated it toward a local animal shelter because she has a soft spot in her heart for all of God's creatures, and so that's wonderful to hear. And I also touched base with Shayla, who told me that her money was donated to St. Jude's, which is an amazing organization, and that I'm sure that money went a long, long way. Well, I have to admit, I'm going to put Tabby on the spot here. Up until this last week, she had not yet donated her money. It's been sitting on our counter, and this was completely filled with coins. And I told her last week, I said, it's, it's time. It's time. To, to donate that money for approaching the holiday season. And so we discussed several options of what she could do with this money, but ultimately she decided to use her money to go toward our Thanksgiving initiative. And so I took her little mason jar of coins to the coin star, and I told her, I said, you know, a Thanksgiving meal costs $50, but you probably don't have $50 in here, but whatever you have, it would be lovely to go toward the Thanksgiving meal initiative. Would you believe when I cashed this out, there was $40 in this little mason jar. 
So I brought home her $40 and she went to her wallet and got another $10 and voila, now she has uh, $50 that she's donating toward a Thanksgiving meal. And I, I bring that not to embarrass her, but to point out how much money, how far this little mason jar can go. I had no idea. So um, we, have, we have collected enough um, money thus far uh, for 37 meals. Um, we have a little bit of ways to go. We have two more Sundays um, before uh, the turkey distribution, which will take place, as Bruce mentioned, on Wednesday, November 21st. We will meet um, at the Landing, um, at the Landing Neighborhoods Clubhouse, um, which we'll post this address in the um, in the newsletter. But it's 2643 Landing Point Drive. That's our clubhouse where our neighborhood pool is situated. It's very close to the entrance of the Landing neighborhood that's by Walmart. And uh, but we'll meet there at 11 o'clock on Wednesday, November 21st. You don't have to RSVP or let me know. Just show up that morning if you're interested and able to donate, or I mean to deliver a, uh, a Thanksgiving meal. Um, if you can deliver one meal, that would be great. If you can show up and you say you want to deliver four meals, we will find four meals for you to, for you to deliver. Um, any and all help is appreciated. But um, I guess at this point, I would just issue a mason jar challenge. If you want to go around your house and lift up the cushions to your couches and uh, empty your pockets and try to fill a mason jar, I think you'd be surprised how far it can go. And maybe we can bridge that gap. We had committed to donating um, somewhere between 50 and 60 turkeys. We have a little bit of ways to go, but uh, we're doing a great job and we appreciate everyone's generosity thus far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. <laughs> two other people that we want to recognize and celebrate uh, each year we have two members of our church that coordinate the Lake Wiley Golf Tournament for the Shriners Hospital, the Children's Hospital in South Carolina. And the last couple of years, they have raised over $100,000 through this initiative. And it is Steve Phillips and David Nichols. They're both here today. They have just been awarded the Corporate Philanthropy of the Year Award uh, for the Carolinas. And we're so proud of them. Steve and David is actually on uh, security duty this morning. But our congratulations uh, to each of you, and we're proud of you. Well, I know why many of you are here today, and that is we're going to give out the awards for the best trunks at Trunk or Treat last week. So Lydia Smith, our Imagine Kids minister, will you come forward? And also uh, your assistant, Cameron Hurst, will you come forward as well and lead us now as we present these awards? And what a wonderful response we had last week. But I did notice how many of you had your trunks up here all decorated, giving out candy Sunday night, but we're not here at church Sunday morning, but we're glad you're here today. <laughs> All right, good morning. Y'all should be really excited about these prizes. They're huge. They're huge. <laughs> All right, so we did five places. Um, if you're mad that you didn't get first place, talk to Andrea Gunn. Where are you, Andrea? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> Andrea did the judging. No, she did a great job. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Cameron and I both had trunks, so we didn't want to, you know, we might be a little biased. <laughs> All right, so in fifth place, do we have slides? because I don't have anything up here to read from. There we go. Fifth place, we had the Turner family, Randy, Jill, Kaylin, and Austin, who did a lovely haunted house. So if you guys want to come up, I saw you. There you are. Maybe we can just have them stand. They get a keychain. You get a lovely Imagine Church keychain. You can split that four ways somehow. <laughs> Okay, well, you can split it, you can split it in half. All right, y'all can stay up here, stay up here, stay up here. I'm just going to make you stand with us. All right, in fourth place, we had Tracy Burge. Now, Tracy did a lovely um, pirate theme, and I was there when Tracy pulled in and was pulling all her stuff, and it just kept coming out of the trunk. And, um, I mean, she made all this stuff that was up there. It was Really impressive. So, Tracy, please come up. You also get an Imagine Church keychain. All right, and then in third place, is that your parents? Yeah. 
Cameron's parents, Jeff and Regina Young. They're not here, are they? Oh, and Bennett is going to accept the gift. Oh, oh Bennett. <laughs> Stand wherever you want, Bennett. You can stand up here if you want, or you can sit. Either way. Bennett, good job, Bennett. Thank you. All right. Second place. This was this was a, a lot. <laughs> a lot of lot of girls up here. They did an awesome job with their mystery machine. So Lauren and Heather Gilkison, Ashley and Elise Davis, Emma Emrick and Elena Jones. We. They're like, come on. Come on. So they get a keychain and a bag. Y'all also get to do some creative cutting with a, an Imagine Church tote bag and an Imagine Church keychain. So y'all can work that, work that out however you see fit. All right, and then in first place, we have the Galeotas, Craig and Stephanie, Addie and Lexi. And this, the dog was awesome, I gotta say. <laughs> because he was a little crab and his eyes kept falling over his real eyes. And so it was super cute with their beach theme. Um, you guys want to come up and you get all kinds of stuff. So there's a tote bag, a keychain, and a water bottle. So. Craig? Craig, you don't get any portion of the prizes then. All right, so thank you. You know, I have to say I was really impressed. Not only was it our first one, and by the way, Ashley Shaler asked over a year ago if we could do, I think it was, no. Oh, I've only been in this job six months. Um, <laughs> six months ago, if, she could, if we could do truck retreat this year. And I'm so glad we did it. Um, Cameron was a huge help. The photo booth that was set up, Cameron's husband, Michael, um, did the, the little pumpkin and all the games and stuff and then all the trunks were amazing so thank you everybody for coming out it was a really good time thank you thank you so much Lydia and Cameron for such excellent leadership in this event and be thinking about your trunk theme for next year go to have we're going to take just a moment in our worship now and we're going to dismiss our Imagine Kids and their leaders to go to their sessions this morning. However, we're asking Imagination Youth to remain through communion in our worship and then we'll dismiss them to go with their leaders. Thank you Imagine Kids leaders for all that you do each week with this wonderful and amazing ministry in the name of Christ. Halloween is fun, for it's candy you seek. But did you know it's not the only holiday this week? All Saints Day falls on the 1st of November, and we celebrate it together as a way to remember the saints of the church, both famous and not, for their example of faith and for loving a lot. What is a saint, you might ask your pastor, but I'll answer that question, it's probably faster. Saints are people who love God and others. They see everyone on earth as their sisters and brothers. We give thanks for those who have died this last year. We say their names, we smile, we might shed a tear. And as they sing God's praises, we can join in the chorus by doing for others what the saints have done for us. Be kind, forgive, tell other people about the love of God that makes you want to shout. God is great. God is good. God always comes through, just like the Bible said God would. So enjoy your candy, but don't forget to say, along with Trick or Treat, Happy All Saints Day. For us in Imagine Church, All Saints Day this year takes on particular meaning and solemn meaning because it's a rare experience for us to say goodbye to one member of our faith community as she departs this life and enters the life immortal, and that is Ruth Ogrens. And many of you know that we have prayed for Ruth over the last five months. Ruth was 82 years of age and had a wonderful and remarkable life, free of any illness until these last five months. 
And on October 30th, she left the church, the church militant to join the church triumphant in heaven, to join with all the saints. And so this year on All Saints Day, as we read the names in just a few moments, we'll include Ruth as a member of Imagine Church in our hearts, but a member of the church triumphant in God's great realm of heaven. All Saints, November 1st or the first Sunday in November, is a day of remembrance for all the saints with the New Testament meaning of all Christian people of every time and place. We celebrate the communion of saints as we remember the dead, both of the church universal and of Imagine Church. And for this reason, in just a moment, the names of persons in our church family and loved ones who have died during the last year will be solemnly read as a response to the word of God. May we pray together. We bless your holy name, O God, for all your servants who, having finished their course, now rest from their labors. Give us grace to follow the example of their steadfastness and faithfulness to your honor and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let me invite you, will you please stand for the naming of the saints. Stuart Allen McCaffrey. Joyce Redwine Hayes. Jennifer Warren Gilkison. Gladys Ruth Merrill Layton. Charles Raymond McClure. Thomas Carlisle Gilkison, Sr. Ruth Davis Ogrens. May we join together in prayer for all the saints. Ever-living God, this day revives in us memories of loved ones who are no more. What happiness we shared when they walked among us. What joy when loving and being loved we lived our lives together. Their memory will forever be a blessing in our hearts. Months or years may have passed, and still we feel near to them. Our hearts yearn for them. Though the bitter grief has softened, a duller pain abides. For the place where they once stood is empty now. The links of life are broken. But the links of love and longing cannot break. Their souls are bound up in ours forever. We see them now with the eye of memory, their faults forgiven, their virtues grown larger. And so does goodness live and weakness fade from sight. We remember them with gratitude and bless their names as their memory is a blessing forever. And we remember as well the members who but yesterday were part of our church family and community. To all who cared for us and labored for all people, we pay tribute. May we prove worthy of carrying on the tradition of our faith, for now the task is ours. We give you thanks that they now live and reign with you. As a great crowd of witnesses, they surround us with their blessings and offer you hymns of praise and thanksgiving. We are grateful, O oh God, that in your clearer presence they are alive forevermore. In the name of Christ, our risen Savior, we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The series that we begin this morning, I Love My Church, is more than just a sermon series. It introduces our fall commitment campaign as we have the opportunity to renew our commitment to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This will culminate on Sunday, November 18th in two weeks when we have the unusual experience of gathering at 10 o'clock for brunch together and then worship together in the same room down in 122 A, B, and C. But one of the things that we're going to do as part of this I Love My Church initiative is to hear just a word of one's faith experience 
as a member of our church family will just share from his or her heart about how God has intersected with life in such a way that they realized that God is present and at work in all of our lives. Chris Jones will begin this for us today, and I want to invite Chris to come forward and, and share for just a few moments one of the, his stories of faith. And Chris, thank you for sharing with us in worship this morning. We're grateful. Thank you, Bruce, for, um, for this opportunity. <clears throat> um, I'm a little nervous. So. <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to spend uh, just about a whole day with Bruce. And when you're around somebody, basically for a whole day, you have a tendency to talk about a lot of different things. And um, I shared uh, something with Bruce um, that day that uh, about my life that... Uh, <clears throat> I haven't shared with a lot of people. <clears throat> I was raised in a Christian home, in a, in a Pentecostal church is my background. Um, you know, the speaking of tongues and the shouting, you know, some people think crazy people, you know, stuff like that. But uh, <clears throat> um, so I was raised in a godly home. I mean, we were always in church twice on Sundays, Wednesday nights, you know, vacation Bible school. And uh, so my foundation was built. On, on, on faith but as I got older straight away from that sort of did my own thing um, I had my first beer when I was 16 <clears throat> and I took a liking to it <clears throat> and uh, all through high school I hung, hung around with a, with a crowd that partied a lot and um, there was always beer around drank a lot kept it from my parents my parents knew what was going on, but they never really said anything to me. Um, partly, in fact, maybe they were hoping I was just trying to find my own way. I graduated high school, uh, went off to college, still doing the same thing. Of course, you know, I was, had a lot of time on my hand in college. I didn't work. So you get done with class, what do you do? You hang out with friends, you drink a few beers. By my senior year, I was probably drinking six, eight, ten beers a day. Just being foolish, drive when I was drunk. Um, no better than to do that in my life. Stupid. Dumbest things I've ever done. <clears throat> I graduate college in 95, and I moved down here. I don't have a job. I, I moved in with a uh, college friend of mine. We both moved down here together. I'm working part-time at Champ Sports at South Park just to eat, living off what little bit of savings that I had. I didn't ask for help from my parents because I wanted to find my own way. I wanted to show Dad I could support myself. <clears throat> and um, October 31st, 1995, I got off work. <clears throat> Me and a group of friends from work decided we were going to go. It was Halloween. We were going to go to a bar. So we went to Vinny's, what used to be Vinny's on South Boulevard. Had some drinks, had a lot of drinks. About 1.30 in the morning we left. I'm driving down South Boulevard and I'm hungry. So there was a drive through that was open <laughs> that I went through uh, to get something to eat. As I'm in the drive through I'm getting ready to place an order. All of a sudden, blue lights start flashing. And I look behind me and there's a cop sitting behind me. He pulls me out of the drive through at this restaurant. Comes up to me and starts talking to me, pulls me out of the car, puts me in his front seat of his car. <clears throat> and he says, he told me that I was weaving all over the road on South Boulevard. I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't recall that. I don't remember it. <clears throat> I don't know how fast I was driving. The only reason I know it was about 1.30 in the morning is, that, is that's what time he told me it was. He asked me to blow into a breathalyzer. I think it said .20, if I remember correctly. Um, and everybody knows .08 is legally drunk. He pulls me out of the car, and when he told me to get out of the car, I thought I was, I thought I was done. 
I mean, keep in mind, I have a part-time job. I have no income. I'm still on mom and dad's insurance. How am I, I've got nobody to call who can bail me out of jail. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So I failed the breathalyzer test. He gives me two field sobriety tests in front of his car, you know, foot in front of the other. I failed that. I couldn't do it. And then he tells me to stick my arms out, lift one foot up, put my head back, and count to 10. And put my foot down when I reach 10. I put my foot down at 7. And he, he just looked at me, didn't say anything. He tells me to have a seat in the front of his car. So I fell a breathalyzer and I failed two field sobriety tests. I'm, I'm freaking out at this point, you know. Um, he gets back in the car, and of course, he has my driver's license in his hands. <clears throat> he looks at me, and he's, he, he says, um, what do you think I should do with you? And I told him, I told him, I, and I looked at him, and I told him, I said, if you don't take me to jail, you're not doing your job. I could not believe I said those words. I looked out the window, and I said, holy cow, did I just say that? And what seemed like an eternity he didn't say a word that cop looked at me he gave me back my driver's license told me to call a cab and go home and sleep it off I don't know why he did that <clears throat> I got a little bit of time past that I, I went home I called a cab I went back to my apartment and for about the next year and a half to two years, <clears throat> that stuck with me, but I still tried to live the life that I was living. <clears throat> there was one week in July of 1997, I felt something that was pulling at me. I went home one weekend. <clears throat> to visit my parents. We went to church that Sunday morning. <laughs> and I realized that my forgiveness was bought by the blood of Christ. And on July 21st, 1997, I celebrated my second birthday by accepting Christ in my life. <clears throat> and I reflected back on Halloween of 1995 and what that officer did for me. I don't know if you have a moment in your life that you can look back on, that you can actually point to that said that moment in life changed the direction of your life. The fact that that police officer let me go and didn't charge me with DWI meant that two years later, I got a job with Enterprise Rent-A-Car, that I met a friend who led me to my wife. who, if I'd have got a, a DWI, I would have never got that job at Enterprise. I would have never met that friend. I would have never met my wife. I wouldn't have the beautiful daughter that I got now. And I wouldn't be standing before you today. That police officer changed my life by letting me go. And I fully believe God used him at a moment in time. when I needed it. And that moment changed my life and allowed me to be here before you today to share my experience. I am a sinner saved by grace through faith. And God is everything to me. 
My name is Chris Jones, and that's my story. There's a line that comes to mind. When truth is on the scaffolds and evil on the throne, God standeth within the shadows, keeping watch over his own. And I thought of that line as I listened to Chris share his life experience. And the reminder to us all that God is forever at work, perfecting, reclaiming, making us whole, and using us in his service. Thank you so much, Chris. I could think of no better way to introduce the sacrament this morning than what Chris just shared with us. Life before God is perpetually an opportunity to start again and to make life Genesis 1-1 all over again. And if there is any need in your life that needs reclaiming, redeeming, or renewing, God stands ready this morning to receive you and to do in you what God has done in our friend and brother Chris. Let me invite Heidi to come to the table with me, Deborah and Michelle Trent, who are lay reader this morning. And I remind you that the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the invitation is given not by a minister, not by a church, but by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will not cast out. There's no barrier for you to come to God this morning. Neither age, nor church affiliation, nor denomination, none of that is important. The invitation is given by Christ, and your response and your willingness to receive is what matters. For on the night that his disciples betrayed and deserted him, the Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after he had given thanks to God, he broke the bread and gave it to his followers, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. And after he had given thanks to God, he passed it to his followers, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. We do not come to this table, O Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but relying solely upon your love and mercy, your grace and forgiveness. In your mercy, O God, accept us as we are, but remold us, mold us, remake us, make us new in the image of Christ our Savior. We pray this with humble gratitude in our hearts, in the name of Christ. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for it is one loaf of which we all partake. Is not the breaking of the bread a means of sharing in the body of Christ? Is not the cup over which we give thanks a means of sharing in the blood of Christ?
invited to come. There are two stations, one for either side of the chapel. We'll invite the praise team members to commune first. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. is my daily bread your very word spoken to me and I I'm desperate for you This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily. This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me, and now I'm desperate for you. And 
This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. As we begin our new series this morning, I've asked Michelle Transu if she will share God's word and lead us in prayer before the message. Michelle, will you come and lead us now? And we thank you. Good morning. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and from the book of Acts, chapter 1. Out of reverence for our Lord Jesus Christ, as you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Please say this after me. This is the Bible. Bible. It is inspired, eternal, and true. And I place myself myself under the authority of God's word. First, from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you going at this time to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Please join me in a moment of prayer. O Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to commune together, to worship And we pray that you open our hearts so that we can take in Bruce's sermon and all of the lessons and opportunities. We offer up in prayer this week the great celebrations of of Deborah and Scott's wedding. We pray for those that are impacted by sudden loss and unexpected illness. We are all family here, and we pray for all of those in need. Please lift them up and encourage them. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. One morning I walked into a church, but it wasn't on a Sunday. I looked around and I saw the empty seats, the sun glistening through the dust in the air. At first I was distraught at the sight of the empty chairs, 
But then, I was filled with joy. I realized that the people who were once in those chairs were now outside of the building, working at their jobs, serving in their communities, laughing with their co-workers and growing with their families. They had the opportunity to be the church, not just sit in it. When will we be like them? When will we see the opportunity given to us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, bringing hope into the world? Stained glass can't pray for the sick. These walls can't preach the gospel, but you can. The building you're sitting in is just a building. But if you trust in Jesus, then you are the church. Well, I don't know what comes to your mind or what you feel, because for some of us, it's more of an emotion than it is a thought. I don't know what comes to mind or what you feel when you hear the word church. But it's my hunch that it's a far cry from what the people in the first century thought of when they thought of that initial gathering. Because in the first century and from the very beginning, the church has been a movement. It didn't begin as an institution. It didn't begin with liturgy. It didn't begin with tradition. There weren't any Bibles. There weren't any banners. There were no screens or bands. There weren't any buildings or facilities. There was no staff. There was no hierarchy. From the very beginning, the church began as a movement. And it began as a movement around the very simple idea that unfortunately we only really talk about once a year. The church was launched around an event in history. And that was the resurrection of Jesus. And it was the resurrection of Jesus that galvanized those first century believers around this simple idea that Jesus was, in fact, who Jesus claimed to be. It was that one single event, and it was the testimony by eyewitnesses to that event that basically launched the local church. But from the very beginning, it began as a movement. Now, as we begin this series today, I want to give you a little background around this whole idea of church. We're going to look at a Greek word together. And for those of you who don't think I ever go really deep, today we're going to go deep. Okay? In fact, we're even going to see this little Greek word. So this is a deep day, all right? You're going to learn Greek today. And here's a little history lesson. And this is very, very important. So if you grew up Catholic or if you grew up Protestant or if you didn't grow up in church at all, this may fill in some of the gaps in your thinking when you think about church. But my goal for us today is to begin to rethink church and maybe even redefine in our hearts what the church is all about. Because at the end of the day, the church launched as a movement. And imagine church, brand new, is an example of the fact that the church is still moving. Because one very smart person told me once that movements move. And so the church continues to move. Now here is the fascinating and sort of academic part of this. In the Greek New Testament, the little word that's translated church, we're going to put it up here on the screens for you, is ekklesia. In fact, let's just say it together because it's really kind of fun to say. Would you say it with me? Ekklesia. And now you know Greek, all right? And literally, this little Greek word ekklesia means an assembly or gathering. That's what it means. An assembly or gathering or maybe a congregation. And throughout the Greek New Testament, you see this little Greek word, ekklesia, and it simply means an assembly, a gathering, or a congregation. And when Jesus launched the church, he launched it as a gathering of followers around one simple idea with a very simple message and a very simple focus. But then something, I think, tragic happened in history. Something terrible happened. As time went on, there was a transition from the idea of a movement to a location, from a gathering around an idea to a hierarchy, from the dynamic around a simple message of a simple event in history, the resurrection, things began to transition to something entirely different. 
And if you know any history at all, any church history or any medieval history, you know that the church went through a terrible, embarrassing time where everything went wrong with the local church. And that terrible, horrible period of history was launched in some way by a misunderstanding of the word church. Because that little Greek word that couldn't be any clearer, ekklesia, was transitioned into a different word. And I want to show you this word. We're going to put it up here. It's actually a German word, and I can't pronounce it in German. I won't even try to do that. But you can see the English derivative of this word, kirch. It actually came from the Goths around 300 A.D. is where we got our English word for church. And it literally meant in 300 A.D., the Lord's house. I'm not going to bore you with all the history, but essentially over time, this idea of a gathering or a movement, an assembly, a congregation, transitioned into this idea from where we get the English word church. So throughout your English New Testaments, the little word ecclesia is translated church. In fact, it's a throwback to the Old Testament idea of a temple. Because in Israel, you remember, there was a temple, and the people gathered in the temple, and they thought God lived in the temple. And this transition resulted in some terrible theology. And before long, the church was located in a building. And whoever controlled the building controlled the church. And whoever controlled the church controlled the scripture. And whoever controlled the scripture controlled the people. And in some, some segments of Europe, whoever controlled the people controlled the government. And over time, what began as a movement Distributing truth throughout the world became a very insider-focused, hierarchical, ritualized, destructive, unethical institution that in no way reflected what was launched in the first century with those very first Christ followers. And the shift from a gathering, an assembly, a congregation resulted in the idea that the church was a location. It was a hierarchy, a set of rituals. And that's all part of the reason why some people even today, continue to turn their back on the local church. In fact, that same idea that began in 300 A.D. is reflected in some churches or even some denominations yet today. But then something awesome happened. In the 16th century, in the early 1500s, a guy showed up in England, a scholar. His name was William Tyndale. In fact, we've got a picture of him right here. Smile, William. They never smiled in those pictures back then. But William Tyndale was a British author and scholar, and he decided it was time for the average person to have access to the Bible. Because in that day and age, in the 16th century, people had to go to the church and listen to a priest read from a translation of the scriptures that the average person couldn't even understand. They had no access. And if you control the Bible, you control the truth, you control the church, you control the people. And William Tyndale decided, enough of this. The people, they need to have access to the truth of God's word. And he began to translate. He was the first person to do this. He began to translate from the original Hebrew and Greek text into English. And the church leaders were furious with him. He became an outlaw and had to leave England. And so he fled to Germany where he continued to do his translation and work. And thanks to Gutenberg, who lived about 100 years before him, he began to print copies of this English Bible, and then he smuggled them into England. And suddenly, the average person could hold the Bible in their hands and understand it in a language that was theirs. He was eventually betrayed by a friend, brought back to England, and tried for being a heretic. They hung him, and then they burned his body. And they discarded him as a heretic and an enemy of the church. But it was too late. Because now the word was out. The English-speaking people had a copy of the scripture. And the church, the institutional church, began to lose power. Because the average person could actually hold a copy of the scriptures themselves. And during his trial, he made this statement. It's one of his famous statements. He said this, If God spare my life, ere these many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. And he said that to the religious leaders of his day. And he accused them of manipulating the scriptures and manipulating the church in order to control the people and to control political policy. But he said, if it's left up to me, I will make sure that everyone who is able holds in their hands and reads the holy scriptures. Now, one of the things that drove the church leaders absolutely crazy 
is that William Tyndale was translating the scriptures, and when he got to that little Greek word ecclesia, he didn't translate it church, the German version of a word that basically meant the Lord's house. In his copy of the New Testament, when he got to the word ecclesia, he used the word gathering because that's what the word means. It was his attempt to return the New Testament and return the gathering of God's people back to what it was meant to be and what it started out as in the first century. And that is a growing mission-centered movement of people with a very simple message for everyone in the whole world around one single event in history, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, William Tyndale was exactly right. The church was a gathering. It was a growing group of people. And that's exactly what Jesus said. In the book of Matthew, there's an incident where Jesus gathers his disciples together and he asks them a question that maybe you shouldn't ask your friends because you might get information you don't really want to hear. But he gathered the group together and he said, hey, what's the word on the street about me? What do pe who do people say that I am? When people talk about me, what do they say? And his disciples said, well, some people think you're a reincarnation of John the Baptist or a reincarnated version of some Old Testament prophet. But then Peter said this. Peter said, I'll tell you who I think you are. I think you're the Messiah, the son of, of the living God. And then Jesus said, check this out. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this, this statement you made was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but, my father in, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, he said, that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my, and here's our word, I will build my ecclesia. I will build not my church building, not my location. I will build my ecclesia. I will build my gathering, my congregation, my assembly, my movement. I will build my church and the gates of hell, or a better idea I think is death, the gates of death will not overcome it. Which meant no matter how many people die, no matter who dies, this will continue on forever and ever and ever and ever. For the church was birthed as a movement of people around a simple message and around a simple idea. It was not about a building. It was not about any of the things that it would end up becoming a few hundred years that followed. It was and would continue to be a movement. Not long after this, Jesus was crucified. He rose from the dead and spent about 40 days with his followers. And then after about 40 days, he called them together on a hillside and gave them his final instructions. In Matthew, we call that the Great Commission. But in the book of Acts, there's a version of that, that when Jesus gives his final instructions, and he predicts, he predict, this is so cool, he predicts the beginning of the church. Just before Jesus left the planet, he gathers with his disciples, and Mary was there, and his brothers were there, the Bible says his sisters, we believe, were there, maybe a hundred other people. And he gathers them on a hillside, and here's what he tells them. When they met together, they asked him, they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Because they were still thinking Jesus was going to establish a kingdom. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power, he said, to this little group of people. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we don't know what they thought, but they probably thought power, power's a good thing. We're going to get some kind of special power. What are we supposed to do with it? And he says, and you will be, as a result of this new power, you will be my witnesses. Somebody who testifies to something. He said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem which is where they were, in Judea, which is the larger area, in Samaria, an area they didn't even like to go into, and to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. To which they probably said, Jesus, time out. Do you know how big the earth is? To which Jesus could have said, you don't even really know how big the earth is. All you know is the Roman world. But this message, this movement, this gathering, this momentum that we're creating is going to touch every single part of the world, which, my friends, is exactly what happened. This is one of the most significant prophecies in all the Bible. Because we are, in some way, we are a fulfillment of it. Because do you know who the ends of the earth is written about? It's written about you and about me. It's our children. It's our grandchildren. It was our parents who embraced Christianity. To the ends of the earth was Jesus' way of saying, this isn't just a Jerusalem thing. This isn't just a this generation thing. This isn't just an us thing. This thing that has begun in your midst, all the supernatural power that you've experienced, this is something that's going to reach out beyond your lifetime and the gates of hell or the gates of death will not stop it. The church began as a movement 
and the world would never, ever be the same. And about 2,000 years later, here we are. You know what, what really connects Protestants and Catholics and people from every culture around the world who name the name of Jesus? You know what the common denominator is? It's not the way we worship, is it? It's not the way we think about liturgy. It's not our customs or traditions. The only thing that galvanizes, the only point of common ground, the only thing we have in common, it's not the way we do communion. It's that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he rose from the dead, and that his death paid for the sins of the entire world, just as Jesus had predicted. It wasn't about a location. It wasn't about a style or tradition, because there was none of that. But there was an energy, there was a dynamic, there was a momentum, there was movement. And since opening day, since day one, there's always been a remnant. There have always been people who knew that a movement had to move. That this is a dynamic that must spread. This is a message that must be told in every single culture and every single language of the world. And when we gather in Jesus' name, we are a part of the thing that we call the church. That has the momentum that's left over. The momentum that was fueled on opening day in the city of Jerusalem. There have always been people who have gotten that. And you know what I love about Imagine Church? It's that the people of Imagine Church get this. You see, if you're new here, this is why when a child or young person gets baptized, you cheer. Because you get this. This is why when we meet in life groups, you understand that you are the church. When we gather here on Sunday mornings, we gather as the church. And when we gather together to deliver Thanksgiving meals to the poor, you're gathering together as the church. And when we deliver bicycles at Christmas, when we send school supplies to kids in the Philippines, when we support a young missionary couple in Nepal, we are moving together as the church. And when we send money every month to God's kitchen or to Young Life or to campus ministry in Charlotte, you are the church. And every time you sit on the floor with boys and girls and imagined kids, every time you go upstairs with middle school or high school students, when you gather with others on a van to make a trip together, in that gathering, you are the church. And there has always been and there always will be a remnant of people who understand that it is not about a location. It's not about style. It's not about an approach. It's gathering around this one simple idea that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that He died for the sins of the world. And that he rose on the third day. And that, that is a message for the entire, the entire, the entire world. So I don't know what comes to your mind or what you feel when you hear the word church. But I hope that as a result of today, maybe it'll be a little bit different. And I hope that as a result of today that you'll never ever allow yourself to slide back into thinking that it's a place. That it's a location. That it's a way of but that for the rest of our lives we would understand that the church is a movement. The church is a movement with extraordinary momentum. And I hope that for the rest of our lives together at Imagine Church that we will stay on task and on mission with what happened that very first day when the church started. Now next week we're going to pick it back up here where the story leaves off. And this is what I'd love for you to do. Most of you have an English Bible. I'd love for you to go home and at some point during the week pull out that English Bible and start reading the rest of the story. I'd love for you to read the book of Acts. Because if you have any connection with the church at all, this is your story. And thanks to William Tyndale and others like him, you can read the Bible in your own language. You don't have to wait for me to read it to you. You don't have to wait to come here to have someone read it to you. Because there has always been and there will always be a remnant of people who understand ecclesia the gathering, the momentum, the movement of the local church around this one simple idea, around one single event that changed and will continue to change the whole world. And my prayer for us is that we would always be a gathering of Christ followers who are right in the center of what God is doing in our midst and in our world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we can only imagine... We can only imagine standing there in Jerusalem and experiencing this. And yet here we are 2,000 years later, gathering in the name of Jesus Christ. And most of us believe that he died from our sins and rose from the dead. And Father, I pray that we would always, always be a part of that remnant. That that group that is right in the center of your will. 
as it relates to your ecclesia. I pray that always would be momentum, there always would be movement. And that, Father, when we hand off Imagine Church someday to the next generation, some of the kids that are right now up in Imagine Kids, some of the youth who are right now upstairs in Imagination Youth, that when we hand it off to them, that it would be in better shape than it was when we started this. Because we all believe that this is a message for those who are still far off. God, thank you for allowing us to handle and to hold your word. Thank you that we can know and read its stories. And I pray that we would be extraordinary stewards of the ecclesia, the gathering of believers who gather in your name. And we pray all of those things in Jesus' name. Amen. The host team will be coming forward in just a few minutes to gather our offerings. And they may seem small and insignificant to us, but the Lord, um, they are a means of feeding the multitude, just as he fed the multitude when they gathered together on the hill. And the boy had loaves and fishes. He was able to give thanks to the Lord and had baskets of abundance. So too can the Lord do that with our gifts and our offerings. So um, he can do all things, but he desires the hearts of his followers to give and to be blessed by that giving. And so um, as we do that, as we return to him what he has given to us already, uh, let us pray that he would use that and make an abundant offering to the world. Father, through the Son, you have led the, fed the multitudes for generations, and you continue to feed us today. We pray, Lord, that you, through the, the bread of life and the living water, we continue to feed us and to nourish our hearts and our souls. We return to you the gifts that you have already given to us, and we ask, Lord, with prayer and thanksgiving that you would multiply them and that they would be a blessing to all in the world as we serve them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. down inside I doubt that you could love me but in your eyes there's only grace now you plead my cause you ride my wrong you break of a 
good worship leader, and Jennifer is a wonderful worship leader, is knowing that it's up to us who are worship leaders who need to adjust when the service runs long. And so we're going to dispense with the closing song this morning because of the time and to preserve our Imagine Kids leaders so they'll come back next week instead of having to <laughs> stay with the kids an extra 15 minutes. Thank you, Jennifer, for being so wise and discerning. But we had a lot of good stuff in worship today that we just wanted to share and God led us to share. Um, welcome to the new folks who are with us. Uh, Lindsay is here for the first time. Kara is here for the first time. We're delighted to have you here. And there's still some refreshments on the table, so don't be in a hurry to leave as you, as you uh, we finish worship this morning. I do want to um, invite you to be here the next two weeks because this is a real important time for our church. We're making some really far-reaching decisions about the future that I'll be able to share more about with you in the next couple of weeks. But we'll continue our series next Sunday as we talk about how God is calling us to be bold. And we're going to talk about what that means. And then the third Sunday, the 18th, when we have our brunch together, is when we really make our commitments uh, for the next year. You'll get a packet of information in the mail the end of this week or early next. They'll go out probably on Thursday of this week. But we're going to talk about the huge opportunity that God has placed in our hands and in our laps. We're not sure why us, but God has placed an incredible opportunity before us, and we're going to talk more about that. So I hope you'll be here the next two weeks. And we don't really have required attendance except for a couple times. One of them is the 18th because we want everybody here for our brunch together and worship together, okay? Would you join me? Would you stand together? And I want you to pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we go now to serve you. Amen.